Okay, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. I'm John Bartz with Network Consulting Services. Thank you for joining us today for our monthly training webcast. Uh, this month's topic is Implementing Palo Alto Network's HIP Profiles. And with me today are Brian Hodzik and Robert Kemeny. Good morning, gentlemen. Hi, everybody. Good, good morning. Hello. This is a deep dive training session on the HIP Profiles, so we'll keep the PowerPoint to a minimum today. Uh, feel free to use the chat function when you have questions. We'll take questions uh, throughout uh, today's webcast. And we are recording this, and we'll put this up for future reference. Uh, gentlemen, uh, take it away. All right, thanks, John. Um, everybody's on mute, so we can't hear you, so please use that chat or that Q&A section. Um, I'm going to be monitoring that, and um, Robert will be kind of taking us through this. So uh, go ahead, Robert. Thanks, Brian, John. Welcome everybody to today. Uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Palo Alto's HIP profiles. Now HIP profiles are host information profiles and we'd like to show you how to uh, use those, what they are and, and uh, how to gain that visibility into your remote workforce and, and how granular this can be. So thanks for joining us today. So guys, this is just a little bit more about the products that we represent. Um, obviously, today we're talking about Palo Alto, but we do the same kind of thing with uh, a bunch of other products. If you ever need help with them, please let us know. Great. So this is kind of our agenda as we cruise through this today. We're going to talk about uh, HIP checks, what they are and how they work, about the HIP objects that we create so that we can have matches, and about the HIP profiles that use those objects to determine matches and then about the notifications that you can send to your uh, end users about these matches or non-matches and how to put those into some security rules. So we'll go through each of these and spend a little bit of time talking about um, how to configure each one and, and what their significance is. So Robert, I keep hearing about this uh, concept of zero trust, um, uh, not just from Palo Alto Networks, but from you know, kind of security industry as a whole. What, you know, what is zero trust? Why do I need to care about it? How does it apply to what we're talking about today? For sure. So um, most of our workforce um, is remote or has the option to be remote, and we want to protect our sensitive data that's, uh, that we have in our intranet or that's on the inside of our network. So uh, the concept of, of zero trust is really one that we should be adopting today, that no matter uh, if it's a corporate laptop or a BYOD device, that we really shouldn't trust it and that we should do our due diligence in, in making um, an effort to check these devices and make sure that they're secure before we allow them access to our internal networks and our sensitive data. Okay, that sounds great. So um, I got a big mobile workforce. They currently VPN in today, um, hopefully with Palo Alto using the Global Protect. Um, so this is something that can uh, help us protect uh, those end devices, make sure that they're kind of up to snuff before they get on, uh, on our network. So let's kind of figure out how we do that. Perfect. Thank you. We'll do that. So let's start with HIP checks, right? As we have uh, our Global Protect um, VPN configured and as we allow devices into that network, we want to be able to gain some visibility into those devices. So built into the Global Protect agent that's available for Windows and for Mac, there is the ability to check against some common criteria. Uh, there are eight categories in which the agent will check um, that it can provide some feedback into. Those categories are general information about the host and its operating system, um, patch, management level, patch management levels, the firewall, antivirus, anti-spyware, disk backup or disk encryption, uh, data loss prevention, and then also a component for mobile devices, iOS and Android, which are currently supported. So that means I can do this not only for my PCs and Macs, but I can also do it on my you know, mobile devices, iPhone and Android as well? Absolutely. You can secure those and require that they have um, uh, either proprietary applications or security settings that meet your uh, company's needs. And Robert, I can't do this with just a generic VPN client. I need the Global Protect client, right? That is correct. You're going to need the Global Protect client. And on the Palo Alto device, you'll need the license for that Global Protect uh, um, portal and gateway so that you can provide this uh, service to your mobile workforce. So just to reiterate, it's not technically part of the base package of a Palo Alto Networks firewall. Um, I need to add that Global Protect license to be able to support this. That is correct. Okay. All right. So um, before we kind of move on to the next slide, I'd, I'd kind of like to show you where where we uh, where we configure some of this stuff. So let me move in a my screen here and let me get logged into 
our firewall, and we can show you where you can begin to collect some of that information from your hosts connecting to your gateway and, and uh, to your portal and to your gateway. <clears throat> so, Robert, this is just your lab environment. Can you tell us a little bit about? Sure. That? So, this is this is running on a Palo Alto 3020. I'm running a version 7.1.0 for the PAN OS, and I have the Global Protect Agent version 4.0.3. Okay, so uh, obviously this was available on previous versions and so forth, so your screens might be slightly different if you're on a newer version or an older version, but uh, the, the, the base, you know, kind of underlying technology is still all the same. That's correct. And the things that we're running through today will be valid from uh, PAN OS 6.0 on to the current version PAN uh, 8.0.4, I believe. So let's take a look at where we can enable some of this. Um, from your PanOS device, if you go to the Network tab and then to your Portal, <clears throat> under your Portal definition and under the Agent tab, when you look at your configuration, there will be a Data Collection tab, which is where you check the box to do HIP Data Collection. Now, as I mentioned earlier, those eight categories that it collects data on, um, maybe you need to exclude some of that information from being collected if you have privacy requirements or privacy concerns. Uh, you can do that here. You can, you can pick an exclude category. We can come in and, and add something from one of the ones that I had mentioned, maybe um, uh, disk encryption or um, the disk backup is not something that you'd want to see. You would add it here. Uh, you would add a vendor and then add their product that you didn't want to collect information on, so uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and then the opposite is true for custom checks, right? We, we talked about the categories that are kind of canned and included out of the box, but what if we want to make sure that they have um, uh, an application that was developed in-house that we require them to have in order to connect to our environment or to be secure in our environment? We would add that in here through a registry, registry key so that it would know to collect that information, and that's available for both Windows and for Mac. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we get into our configuration. But this is where you, uh, excuse me, I didn't mean to close that. This is where you turn on your data collection, right? So you must have that checked for the agent to pass uh, information about its host back to the portal and to the gateway. Robert, can I turn this on without creating any later rules blocking it, meaning just kind of start by collecting information from an audit perspective without blocking it? Absolutely. You can turn this on. The agent will take those default categories we've talked about and will deliver information uh, about the hosts there. So to a customer, you could essentially go and turn it on today, see what kind of information that we get back before we make any decisions on whether we actually want to start blocking things. Because obviously, you know, if we're going to deny someone access to VPN, we want to be, you know, doing it only when it's the correct thing to do. So at least short term, I can, I can gather that information. You can gather. That is correct. Right. Perfect. All right. So this is, uh, this is where we turn on our HIP check in the portal so that it can collect that information. <clears throat> Um, so next we're going to talk a little bit about HIP objects. Uh, HIP objects must be defined so that the, the gateway knows what, uh, the portal, excuse me, knows what information you're interested in gathering. Um, again, I'd like to just kind of dive right in. We can see uh, where we do that. It's under your objects tab and under the left-hand side for we'll protect our HIP objects. I have a few that I've created here, but I, I'd love to run through a couple more so that you guys can kind of get a feel for how to create these. Um, HIP, HIP objects are, are really a, either an on-off, either a yes or no, right? It's going to be a criteria of does it match exactly or does it not match? So um, one, one that we can talk about that's uh, pretty important is uh, one that hit us this year is the, the WannaCry virus, right? So we definitely don't want anybody that, that, that hasn't been patched to be able to connect to our environment uh, for fear of that. So we can, we can come in and make a, a HIP object that will look exactly for that. So let's call this one um, uh, WannaCry. And we're going to say that this uh, is only relevant to Microsoft machines. So we're going to come down in our host information and say Microsoft. Now, if we wanted to be even more granular, we could pick different versions if we knew that our environment didn't have that or if you support BYOD but only on certain versions. 
then you'd want to define that here. So in our HIP uh, object, specifically we're talking about patch management, right? We want to know that it's patched against antivirus. We would come in and click the enable button that turns on that patch management feature for you. And um, we'd want to know that this particular patch has been installed. So that we would leave it is installed. And down here in our patches box is where we can add our particular patch that we're interested in. Uh, I happen to know uh, that this one is 4012212 for a Windows 64-bit uh, Service Pack 1 machine. And, and I assume, Robert, if I don't know that KB article, just a quick Google, you know, to the Microsoft web page that says the KB is going to give me that information, right? This isn't some secret back end. Oh, absolutely, right? Absolutely. We can take a peek at that real quick as well, right? So if we wanted to know um, one, uh, if I can spell correctly today, one, uh, cry patch. Um, we can look at the hot fixes that they have. Uh, let's see, that would probably be a better one is our bulletin. So this is MS 17-010, critical patch for it. Correct. Uh, it talks about uh, the affected vulnerabilities, and then it will come down and list the patches there. So I see the number on the left. I assume I just put the letters K and B um, in and front of it. That's correct. Okay. The CV vulnerabilities listed at the top, and then what KB numbers required to patch. So if you're running Windows Vista, if you're running um, a server 2008, and you put in these numbers with, with that KB. Great. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. So once we've added our, our match criteria in, we can click OK and it will save that object for us. So now we have a WannaCry object, a, HIP, a host information profile object that we can match against. I see some other interesting ones that you already have in here that you had pre-built. Um, there might be a, a slightly more practical, my favorite would be probably, is Microsoft Windows Update turned on? That way you don't have to worry about a particular patch. You can just say, hey, is, is patching in general enabled and you know, is it automatically happening? Absolutely. So let's take a look inside one of those. So if you have um, hosts that run Microsoft, then this would be one of particular interest to you. Again, we would call it what it is, MS System Patches, and come down to our Patch Management tab. And we want to know that is patch management installed? We can choose whether or not it's enabled. If we pick none, then it will look for all of them by that vendor. Uh, same with our missing patches. Uh, Microsoft uses a value one through five for their severity. We can say we're not interested in some that are less than three or four or any of those things. Again, if you leave it at the default of zero, then it's going to check for all of them. Uh, your criteria could also include uh, whether it has none or all of specific patches that you're looking for. Um, and you can come in and narrow it by vendor, right? So we would add the Microsoft vendor. And the product that is responsible for our patch management is both the automatic updates and the update agent. And that's how we build those criteria into this particular object. Um, another one that's worth looking at is our AV requirement. Again, uh, the AV requirement may be something that is uh, general and broad, so we're not necessarily uh, worried about the particular host. But we can come down to our antivirus tab. We would make sure that it's checked so that it's enabled. And then we can pick uh, more criteria. Is it installed? Uh, is real-time protection enabled or available? Um, what about the virus definition? Uh, we can say that it has to be within three days or um, not within a particular amount of days, um, three days, or uh, a particular product version. Is it equal to or greater than, or does it contain a particular version number within a certain range, or even when the last scan time was? Um, do we want to make it within a week, um, uh, within the last three days, or within that particular day or 24 hours? Um, all right. so. Let's change a couple of these back. So under our vendor list here, uh, under um, your antivirus, right, we could pick a particular vendor if we wanted um, a vast or if we wanted Sophos. Uh, and then we could pick particular products by a particular vendor uh, and make that a requirement for this particular 
a um, antivirus one, right? So we can cancel out of that. We're just going to leave it generically. Does it have the antivirus installed for our lab and our demonstration today? Uh, I should probably pause and see if there are any questions in the queue for uh, HIP objects before we can continue. Doesn't look like we have any at this time. So then let's uh, move on. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is our HIP profiles, right? So uh, profiles are built on the objects. Um, we have those criteria that we've specified in our objects list, and we want to take those and build a profile out of them. <clears throat> so again, the same tab on the left-hand side in your Palo Alto, you'll have uh, a place where you can create some profiles. Um, the profiles are strictly Boolean logic. So we can create a profile, maybe we want to call this um, executive profile, right? Maybe it was just for executives. And then in the match field is where we add from those objects our logic. So of the objects that I have created, we could build a profile that says maybe we want to make sure that they match the AV requirement. Um, maybe we want to make sure that they are running Windows 7. I built one that was an OS check for Windows 7 for our executives. Um, sometimes it's important that they not match a particular profile. We had our system patches, right? And so our object, again, is strictly a match. Does the, the host match this object or not? So if we built one that's looking for some security patches and it matched that it was missing some of those patches or matched that patch requirement, uh, maybe we would want to exclude it. So here's where we pick our operator for that Boolean logic. And we would say, we don't want it to have any Microsoft patches that are missing. So that's what our logic would look like. And I want you to make sure that it has OS 7, that it matches that one. I want you to make sure that it matches our AV requirement. But I don't want any of the Microsoft patches to be um, missing on that machine. And, and, and you, can, you can build these for, uh, the profiles can become quite complex. Um, you could uh, put in some parentheses and have some uh, another and statement. So here's one set of logic. It can be these requirements. This is for Microsoft and for Windows 7 and any antivirus. Or maybe we have a different set of criteria. Maybe um, we had a Macintosh object, and we want to put our, our Mac object in here. Um, and it would look like that, and then, and then we would close off the parentheses. And, and you can do that same logic. You can have some and and nots in there. And, and so your profiles can become pretty complex as you have lots of objects that you were working on. Robert, I have a question here. Can we only have one profile, or you know, how does multiple profiles work? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So one thing that I, I, I should have shown there is that not only can you build uh, on the objects, but you can also build on profiles. So here are some existing profiles. We can add those into our logic. So you can have nested profiles. You can have nested objects. Um, that was a great question. Uh, you can have lots and lots of profiles. Uh, however, as we look at security rules and enforcing those, you can only define one. Uh, that's not true. You can, you can have multiple profiles, but you need to understand your logic. And it can be a little bit uh, confusing on your security rule. And we'll look at that in a little bit, too. Thanks for that question. Um, all right, so those are profiles that we can build. Um, let's talk about HIP notification, right? So we, we've tried to gain some visibility into our mobile workforce. We, we've started to collect data from them. And then we've started to build these objects that they match, and even profiles that use these objects um, that we're going to use in our security rules. So how does the the client, how does the host receive uh, information? How do they, uh, how are they notified if they're not compliant or if they matched or did not match? And we want to take a look at that. So if we go back to our network tab on the Palo Alto and we select our gateway, inside of our gateway under the agent configuration, we have a tab called HIP notification. Under this tab, you can define how that uh, client receives its notification of match or of not match. <clears throat> so when we click into it, um, 
you can enable a match message, or maybe you don't want them to know. If they're compliant, you just want them to cruise on in, and, and they're not going to receive any kind of a pop-up or, or notification, then, then you'd want to not enable that match message. Maybe it's only important that they know about not matching. So on each of these tabs, uh, they're independent. You can enable and disable that notification. It can be a system tray balloon that's doing the notification, or it could be a pop-up window that comes up on the screen. Um, and in our, in our WYSIWYG editor, you have the ability to change um, the message, right? So you can give them a text message. Um, and this is useful because maybe if they don't match, instead of just telling them that they, they, they didn't match and that you're sorry, they can't get on the network, maybe you want to provide for them um, a place where they can get it. So you could put in a message that would say, get AV here. And um, you would put uh, a link in there. You can do that in our editor. AV And there they have, they have a message that notifies them they didn't match because they didn't have the antivirus installed, and now they have a place that they can go get it and become compliant and then try again. Um, that's how the notifications work. And, and you can have um, multiple notifications, but it will depend on which profile they match and don't match. So if you wanted to create um, a rule that had different profiles on it, then you need to put in also the notifications for each of those profiles in your agent configuration tab for Global Protect. Robert, we have a question here. Uh -huh. How does the client know if they are matched? I assume they're asking, you know, how do they know which profile they ended up landing on from a troubleshooting perspective? Sure. So uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at, at what that looks like on the firewall first. So if we go into our monitor tab, um, the host information profiles uh, aren't considered traffic, right? They're just profiles that we've created. So you're not going to see them in your traffic log. You'll need to come down to your HIP match logs. In our HIP match logs, we can look at what happens when a client connects and the host information is being collected. Again, our objects are simple yes or no matches. So we can see the results of those if we look in this log. We had a test user with test PC2 that matched the OS7 check. So we know that that client um, matched that, that object. Uh, we have also that they matched on a HIP profile that we def uh, defined. And we defined a couple, and they matched on both. So this is where you can come and see what, um, what the clients are matching on. Uh, if you don't have any HIP objects defined, then you're not going to see anything here. There won't be any matches for you to, to compare against. Uh, so as you plan out your, um, your HIP profile and HIP management, you'll want to build objects that are of interest to you. If you want to know about uh, applications they have, then you want to build those into your HIP objects. If you want to know about antivirus, you build those. If you want to know about patches, you build those so that you can come in here and see what your clients are matching on. Over time, this is a great place to get uh, the information that you'll need in order to use security rules. Uh, like Brian mentioned previously, we don't want to enforce something that's going to block users that need legitimate access. So before we come in and make any um, changes to our security rules for HIP profiles, this is where you can be assured and check to make sure that they're matching correctly on your profiles and on your on your objects before enforcing those rules. Um, did that kind of answer the question? So here's where the administrator will come and look for uh, matches for the clients. And then in terms of the client knowing which one they matched on, those messages, if we come back and look, um, uh, relate directly to the particular profile that you've enabled. So this profile, the GPHIP profile, is the one that if we have a match, we're going to pop up a message, or if we don't have a match, we're going to pop up a message. Um, and your message would be descriptive of what they matched on or did not match on. Uh, all right. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about our uh, HIP checks, our objects, and our profiles, and how to, notify, how to notify the client and how the administrator can look and check to see what's going on. 
Uh, let's move on to our security rules. So if we've been watching for a while and, and we feel like we've got some good matches that we want to enforce some rules on, um, this is where we're going we're gonna to define our HIP profiles to limit or allow access to our, our sensitive data on the inside of our network. So what you're telling me, Robert, is everything up until this point didn't ever block anything. It was simply information that we then had from a posturing perspective uh, we've never said stop or don't allow up until this point. That's correct. We, we have not affected traffic in any way. We've just collected information. We've built some objects and, and profiles based on that information so that we can have that, that visibility into our mobile workforce. Uh, we can build in as much granularity as we like. And, and now we're going to talk about where that security rule goes and what it looks like and what it does. So again, from a testing perspective, we never want to just kind of start blocking everything on day one. If I'm an end, if I'm a you know system administrator, like someone on the on the line here, um, I could turn everything I've seen up until this point on without harming any traffic and simply gathering that information, then go at a later date and make the determination if we want to actually start blocking it. So I can maybe start remediating some of the problems uh, you know, before we actually start blocking. Absolutely, that's 100% correct. All right. Um, let's move on to our firewall and talk about our security rules. So, uh, policy tab is where all your security rules are defined. Um, your your global protect or uh, VPN zone is a best practice is to to zone that out so that you can create some security rules that make sense. So here we have a rule that allows uh, from our VPN zone into our uh, trust zone. And, and obviously you'd want to be uh, particularly granular here in defining um, within that zone the users that you've allowed uh, and to what resources uh, internally you've allowed. This is just a generic one for our lab. And so I've put that HIP profile in there. So when you're creating your rules under the user tab, is where you'll find the ability to add your HIP profile. You can have uh, multiple profiles there, but remember, uh, be careful of the logic uh, when, you, when you require um, multiple profiles to be matched or to not be matched and the logic that you have inside there. So uh, let's take a peek at what it looks like for the host when we put that on and when we've enabled that notification. So in our lab, we have uh, a couple of machines we can get logged into real quick. And I can show you <clears throat> what that looks like. Here's our first test machine. <clears throat> So as we connect to our VPN, we can watch the client connecting. And if we come into our uh, host tab on the client, we can see that it's gathering some information about the host that we've allowed. The, the, the host name, the OS, um, what kind of antivirus is there, Robert, I don't have to have that notification network on a success, do I? Not at all. That's completely optional. Uh, if you have executives or uh, your clients that are remote that don't need any notification, that just expect to be connected, then we don't need to enable that pop-up at all. Uh, so as you watched and as I connected, uh, we got a message that, that uh, allowed us to um, know that we were connected and that we were successful. Um, this particular client does meet the ABG requirement in that, in uh, the profile. Uh, so if we were to look at a, a host that's inside, um, we would notice that the traffic flows to that host. Uh, and so on the opposite side of that, let me pull up um, one other machine that would be non-compliant. Sorry, having some technical difficulties oh, with our VMs here. Uh, can't get 
get it on the right screen. There we go. Here we come. Oh, uh, snapped over there. Maybe just try that. All there right, we here we go. Sorry about that. So this particular machine uh, does not have the antivirus installed. And I assume that was the message that we got from last so, time. From had. last time, yeah. We can we can watch again. Is that machine not working well? Um, so let's disconnect the client and uh, we'll... My guess is there's something broken with that virtual machine. But that's okay. We, we get the idea. You, you saw the message there uh, from before yeah. that you'll get the message saying it's not uh, uh, not able to connect. What what would I see from an administrator's perspective? You, you know, if someone calls me, how do I troubleshoot this? How do I know what to do as next steps? You, you know, what, what is either the, uh, the, the logging or kind of troubleshooting methodology? Yeah, that's a good question because most administrators would expect to find uh, denied traffic in your traffic log, and, and it won't show up there. Um, the only place that you'll be able to find that logging is in your HIP match. So if you suspect that a client is called in and has been blocked, the best place to come is to that monitor tab in the HIP match logs so that you can see that they did or didn't match your requirement, your object, or your profile. And that's where you would find that they would be being denied is because they matched on the profile or they didn't match um, when you came in here and looked at the log. Good questions. Uh, is there any other questions we need to take a look at in the queue? Uh, nope, no outstanding questions right now. If anyone has one, obviously type it in really quick. Um. So the stuff that we've uh, done in the console today, the objects that we've made and the profiles that we've made are applicable to both your uh, uh, Mac and Windows. Um, and it can be applied to your uh, mobile workforce with uh, Android and iOS as well. Um, hopefully that can be a great benefit to you as you gain visibility uh, into that workforce and how and when they're accessing your environment. So host information profiles is a great way to be able to control that and to um, comply with the, the idea of zero trust on devices that even you may own or if you're implementing a BYOD, this can be a, a great tool for that. All right. Well, thank you very much, Robert. We appreciate uh, you kind of giving us the rundown. Um, we appreciate everyone on the line for uh, attending today. I'll just kind of throw in my last comments that uh, uh, if anyone has any questions um, or wants help setting this up or, you know, needs some further technical explanation or anything like that, you know, please don't reach, uh, hesitate to reach out to us. Um, you know, talk to your salesperson, uh, you know, or just call our main number and, and, and we can get you some help on getting this set up the proper way, um, even if it's just some advice to kind of point you in the right direction. So, uh, you know, kind of keep, uh, keep your eye on, the, on your inbox. Uh, we like to do these things kind of regularly on all the products that we represent. Um, and we're always uh, open for feedback on things that people want to see. So if you want to say, hey, that was great, but I want to know more about X, you know, just give us an email on X and we'll be happy to to tell you more about that. So, uh, John? Absolutely. Thank, great. Thank you very much. And we are recording this, and I will get an email out uh, probably today or Monday with the recording, and we'll get that up on YouTube for everybody to see. And hope to see you uh, next month for another training webcast. Thanks for joining us today, and have a great day. Thank you, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.